Welcome to the Big Mike Fund Podcast. I'm the Big Mike, Mike Zlatnik, and today it is my pleasure and a privilege to welcome my really good friend, Mark De La Tour. Hi, Mark. G'day, Mike. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. How's Kansas City? Getting cold, right? Yeah, we've had a fall. I mean, you know, we're, we're kind of a four-season city, but fall seems to be a, an abbreviated one sometimes. But no, it's really nice. It's getting a little brisk, but um, no, we're still getting the temperature climbing up to in the 60s and, and low 70s. So it's it's nice time of year. Well, enjoy the fall. The fall has all the colors, uh, but it is getting colder. And I guess I'm in New York, same thing. You just got to dress in layers. You, you <laughs> never know when it's going to be a warm day or it's going to be 40 degrees. So, All right. So um, anything new in the world of Mark? Uh, any any comments on, you know, kids, cats, pets, family, anything? What's going on? Just tell us a little bit about your family and, and we'll, we'll move straight into the business right after. Yeah, sure. We are um, a, a family. We have a, a junior and a freshman in high school. So I've got two high schoolers now, Mike, which is crazy to say because they still seem just like my young little kids. But uh, one of them is playing a lot of competitive baseball. So heading next week down to Vegas on a travel tournament. Um, and my daughter loves volleyball. We just wrapped up high school volleyball. She played a ton of games. I think they had... Uh, 35 games and i think they only lost uh three games so they had a really good really good season you're bringing up champions <laughs> <laughs> so uh hopefully uh your son that's playing baseball one of his baseball here uh, is a major leaguer that would be that would be his dream for sure well enjoy the kids it's a lot of fun to uh go to sporting events with them and they train hard and it's a lot of uh a lot of satisfaction as a parent to see your kids do well in school and also do well in competitive sports. Uh, I know the drill. My, 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 my girls ice skate and we, we certainly love to travel to competitions because uh, we know how hard they train and it's always a lot of uh, a lot of pride for the parent to see uh, your kids compete and do well. Yeah, I think at this age, at a very young age, it's not as imp- it's not so much important. They don't have jobs, right? So their job is not to work. Their job is to work hard, is what I tell them. So if they have a good work ethic, I think we're doing um, you know a good job as parents. And and my son is extremely driven. I mean, he's waking up at five thirty in the morning to go work out for an hour and a half of lifting before he goes to school at seven fifteen. So yeah, he's he's got his head on straight for sure. Wow, that's amazing. You, you brought up uh, a couple of good boys, so congratulations. All right, so let's jump into real estate. So how is real estate in Kansas City? And before we, um, uh, we'll, we'll cover a couple of topics. One is uh, rising interest rates, how it's impacting kind of Kansas City. Uh, also, is this a good time to buy real estate? A uh, number of folks are a little bit concerned with rising interest rates. Is this... Um, uh, the right opportunity, the right time. Uh, are, the, are the deals good enough or people should sit and wait for a better deal or the deals that they get today are still great deals. So uh, any quick thoughts on, let's start with, is this a good time to buy real estate still? Yeah, I mean, I'm a big believer in um, a buy and hold mentality. It would not be a good time at all, Mike, if you're speculating, if you're trying to time the market or flip a house. Um, Got to be very, very cautious. Uh you know, the retail market has certainly dried up here in Kansas City. Um, as you know, we do probably 70% kind of full turnkey um, rent selling rent. So for your audience out there, turnkey real estate is the idea that we would buy a house, rehab it, get it rented out, and then sell that asset that's a rental ready product uh, with a tenant in place to an investor who's just looking to build a portfolio. That's a turnkey rental. And so we do about 70% of that. We also have about 30% where we flip because we obviously we're out there trying to find deals. And so there's always, you know, opportunities and deals on the on the uh, flip side where we might buy something for uh, 250000 We put 50000 into it, try and sell it for 360, 380, something like that after all expenses. Um, you know, try and, you know, make a, a 10, 15% margin on, on those houses. Um, those margins are getting compressed. Um, it w- wasn't a huge part of what we did. Uh, we cleared out of most of the inventory pre-crash, just obviously with seeing it coming. But uh, I'll be honest, I mean, there's been houses we've lost money on, and that's a, a very strange thing for us, Mike. I mean, we pride ourselves in, in uh, hitting, you know, just singles all day long. We don't hit many home runs. We're not trying to make $100,000 on a transaction or anything like that, but just a lot of base hits and singles. Um, but even on the singles, sometimes when you've only got a you know ten percent margin and on one particular area, um, there's just no buyers anymore. Um, with interest rates climbing up to seven percent, 
Uh, we have certainly felt the impact. And I think our market has seen about a 10, sometimes a 15% uh, drop in the uh, price of our uh, assets. And so uh, on, the flip, on the flip side with retail buyers, that's caused um, you know, some consternation and try, us trying to get rid of product in a, in a meaningful way. Um, but back to your question of wh- whether it's a good time to buy, um, that's offering us uh, opportunities in the market to buy deeper. And for our investor base, we're obviously pricing our turnkey product uh, cheaper than we would have perhaps six, seven months ago. So there are discounts in the market for those that are wanting to uh, buy and hold long term. It's, it's a great time to buy. Yeah, Mark, I greatly appreciate the color. And it makes sense uh, as interest rates rise and the buyers dry out, um, you as the buyer um, of three rehab properties, uh, you get a better deal. And and that's the whole idea is you get a better deal, you put the uh, construction in place, you execute, and then you sell to the turnkey uh, buyer at a lower price. And that makes total sense. Yeah, lower price and higher cap rate. So our cap rate has remained the same, Mike. So, I mean, essentially what we've done is as interest has increased and actually a little bit, we actually had to do an insurance adjustment as well because our insurance rates went up um, when we turned the corner. So we've had a little bit of a bump in insurance and obviously a, a bump in the interest rate that we were projecting. We were projecting at a, you know, five and a half and now it's at a six and a half. Um, so the interest rate has gone up and that obviously means that if we want to continue to sell at a seven cap, we reduce price. And so our investors are getting a better deal than they would have um, just a short while ago. Right. So that makes a lot of sense. I mean, cash, you're, you're trying to basically um, package, I guess, to investors for a cash and cash return. So I assume that that cash and cash return, you're trying to keep it uh, the same level. And as rates rise, you have to lower the price to make the numbers work. Exactly. The, we've got two numbers that we really focus on. There's the cap rate and the cash on cash return. The cash on cash return, we're still trying to prove into double digits, um, but we're consistent with the cap rate at 7%. Yeah, it makes sense. So, uh, but the market cor- has corrected, and, and that's that's an important point. The market has corrected, uh, as you said. If I if I understood it correctly, ten to fifteen percent. That that's what has happened in what in the last since what since March. Is that the correction? No, Mike. I think it's even more compressed than that. I think it really only happened. I mean, gosh, June, July was still hot months for us. I think after July, it's really been the last three months that there's just been a screaming of breaks thrown on the market. Um, I mean, clearly, it, it seems to me that the Fed is trying to do this. The government is trying to slow down at all costs. It has to battle inflation. So they are literally raising interest rates at a rapid pace to try and just curb all kinds of activity. And obviously, in Kansas City, you know, like most uh, markets, we have a season and, and the hottest season of the market is, you know, July, August, September. So that was obviously spurred on with people trying to buy. But once September hit, it almost ground to a halt on the retail sales. Um, and so, yeah, it's been inventory is now creeping up. Um, demand is down. And so those that are have to sell, the only way they can do it is dump price, which is why those speculators that have to sell at all costs, the only way they can sell is by dumping. We're very patient. We're not uh, on our flip stuff. We're in a good position. So we're just patiently holding. Um, I'm, I'm, we've reduced price for sure, but we're not just dumping. Um, we feel like on a newly remodeled product, our stuff will sell before someone else's. So we're we're being very cautious on making sure that there's we're, we're hitting that perfect amount of a, a price reduction at the same time, not giving the house away. Yeah, appreciate the caller. Uh, most of the, I guess, Midwest and um, Northeast all, all has massive season. And if you're in these, uh, in the weather, when people come out, when the weather is nice, um, then the, the demand for, for purchases is obviously high. And the summer, the rates were substantially lower. Uh, the rates have moved since um, early summer or middle of the summer up substantially. And as a result, yeah, we're dealing with demand destruction. And um, I'm reading the book, and you, you've heard of this book, but it's a great book uh, called The Lords of Easy Money. Mm-hmm. And it's, a, it's a phenomenal book just kind of explaining the inner workings of the Fed. And um, I, I'm an economist in heart, so to me, uh, reading the book, uh, I discover a lot of insight or how they uh, have discussed the issues, how they think about it. But at the end of the day, you're absolutely right. Jerome Powell, um, with a well-respected Fed chair, um, he is on a mission to fight inflation. And he's made multiple statements that they can't fight, fail the inflation fight. 
So I, I don't see them stopping anytime soon. And everything you said is consistent with many other markets where the prices have softened simply because affordability. People just can't afford higher mortgage rates. Uh, it's debt to income ratio. So if you're buying a home to live in and whatever your income is, uh, these rapid and very uh, so fast and furious interest rate increases have hurt DTI. Debt to income ratio, you just can't meet the requirements. So you can't afford to pay what you paid before. This is the math is pretty simple. And I think so, we're also might going to get in a position, and this is not a now, but this is a, a year or two years from now, where those people that bought, say, two or three years ago that have locked in a 2.75% rate, and now everyone's get the itch, you know the deal, everyone kind of, you know, the white picket fence and the, the house and two kids, suddenly they have four kids. Five years later, they want to move into a bigger house. How can they move from a, two? let's call it a, a $200,000 mortgage, at 2.75 to a $500,000 mortgage at seven or 8%. I mean, they're, they're just not going to move. So I think the, not only is it an affordability crisis, it's also gonna stop um, people from moving, which, which then stops title, uh, U-Haul trucks, um, you know, handyman, house inspectors, appraisers, you know, mortgage company. I mean, the, 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 the ramifications of just slowing down housing is, is vast and wide. Yeah, I mean, they call it demand destruction. That's all they can do. The, the government printed too much money, caused a lot of inflation. Obviously, COVID uh, caused supply chain problems. But at the end of the day, they only have one tool. And they what, what they control is uh, the money supply and, and the interest rates. And yeah. the, the goal is to uh, get inflation under control. And that will, will cause, is causing exactly what you're saying. Um, and then, by the way, the, the point you brought up about the interest rates being 275 or 3 percent or three and a half on a previous property and folks cannot move because uh they can't afford a new newer house with a much higher interest rate that is absolutely um, a problem in the residential market and the commercial market the, the problem may manifest manifest itself a little differently folks who bought in with bridge loans and those loans mature from three four five years ago now they need to refinance same problem happens the only saving grace in this environment is inflation causes rent inflation so the rents go up as rents go up incomes go up and that's the uh supposed to be the offsetting factor but for the owner occupied you're right if you are a family of two and you had two more kids and you're trying to buy a bigger house good luck with that it's it's it's, it's, it's a massive problem from that perspective yeah i think the other um thing that we've noted here in the kansas city marketplace is new construction grinding to a halt um for single family homes, at least the sales of new construction, single family homes have just ground to a halt. The only thing that's still selling is, you know, multifamily new construction, there's still apartment complexes, and, and we're building fourplexes and duplexes that are still, you know, in demand. So we feel confident in our positioning on those. But um, I have a, a friend um, that is, <laughs> he came and talked to me the other day, and he has 21 lots in a new subdivision that he had kind of gone all in on and he has not been able to sell the first six houses that have come out of the ground and it was just terrible timing again should have seen it coming but at the same time um you know he's in a world of hurt i just don't know how he exits because the only exit for that you know they're they're so expensive that you can't rent them really i mean uh, i don't th and you can't have a whole subdivision of short-term rentals. I mean, I know a lot of people, in fact, one of my strategies, there's two properties in Kansas City that, you know, we are not in a good position on. And if I had to sell them retail, I would probably lose, you know, maybe 30 or $40,000. Um, but as a short-term rental, they'll turn around in cash flow. So I've got an exit strategy on two higher end homes in good areas that now have just not been able to sell, but you can't have a whole subdivision of short-term rentals. So um, very low exit strategy. And I think it, those are the kind of opportunities I think you know, people are saying, what are the opportunities? I think there's going to be a lot of people that, you know, suddenly became a new home builder because they thought that was a, a cool thing to do. And um, there'll be those opportunities of people going under and bank banks having to take back um, these kind of um, single family communities again. And um, REO pop, uh, will be popping up, um, you know, in the next in the next 12 months. Yeah, that's an interesting observation that, um the Fed is going to accomplish what they're actually trying to accomplish. They will put the economy in a severe recession. And I, I, I've, I've spoken about this multiple times, but really inflation can't come down until unemployment comes up. It, it, it's, a, it's the Phillips curve. 
the the it, it symbolizes the relationship between unemployment and inflation and the fed can't stop until inflation comes down inflation doesn't come down until the unemployment comes up in order for the unemployment to come up you need to have a lot of layoffs because there's a very sh substantial shortage of labor until and unless um, we start seeing substantial corporate layoffs and the layoffs will be driven by the weakening economic activity I and mean, that's your classic recession so from, from my perspective at least the way i see it is what we need to start seeing substantial layoffs announced then inflation will, will have a chance of of curbing and the fed is it's just not taking the foot off the pedal until they're going to cause enough damage again demand destruction damage all the related activities that where, where the transactional volume falls no activity of that a lot of people will not have the jobs because there's nothing to support uh and the same concept uh, could apply to big banks a lot of a lot of transactional volume will fall and a lot of banking employees uh should be looking for um fortunately uh pink notices so um well whatever they call pink slips or go go look for, for a better uh, job yeah so no doubt they, coming, it's they, unfortunately yeah, there's a, a local a friend of mine is a, a mortgage owns a mortgage brokerage here, and uh, he's already laid off. I mean, the refi business, as you know, is is non-existent now. There's no such thing. So, um, you know, there are uh, layoffs happening already. And um, when I've heard one uh, protagonist uh, state that gas prices will hit eight dollars a gallon um, sooner rather than later, and I mean, that's just going to trickle down. I mean, it has to have an impact. There's no way that goods get to our front door without, you know, some gasoline being spent. So, um, yeah, it's going to have a massive effect. Yeah, just a quick comment on the energy side. So you have a great point that there's a concern that the energy prices could climb into the cold winter. And the concern is real. Um, it's certainly going to hurt uh, Europe a lot more than us. Uh, at the same time, what they're doing is, is the, the demand destruction will weaken the demand for, for, for oil too. So as much as this fear of oil shooting through the roof, I'll also comment that uh, as the economy slows down, the demand for oil will slow down. So um, the oil price, oil, it's energy, it goes into everything. So inflation can't really come down either until the oil price starts retreating because oil prices into everything from transportation to manufacturing, to heating and so on. So we do need to see oil soften uh, as a as a part of the story to get the inflation under control. Anyway, um, so what are the again, all that aside, though, this gloomy and doomy picture <laughs> are the good news, right? Let's let's shift to the a little bit of the opportunities. So why should people still buy turkeys today? What's the what's the bright side? Uh, can they buy something better in six months? The, the, this is one of the questions that folks struggle with. If I sit on cash, yeah, inflation is destroying it. On the other hand, if I buy this house for 150000 maybe I can buy that house for 130000 in six months. If I can get that kind of a discount, I, I can live with the, uh, the fact that the money is going to be idle for six months. Why should they buy today? Yeah, great question. And we're getting that question a lot with all of our investors. And the deep discounts um, you know, that people are expecting, I think there's a a disconnect between thinking that they're going to get a twenty or thirty thousand dollar discount on a price. Um, inflation is holding asset values actually um, very high, um, and so we're encouraging all of our investors um, to that that it is a good time to buy. Rental real estate does not ebb and flow the same way the retail real estate does. So when I'm talking about movements in the market of Kansas City going up and down, I'm certainly referencing the retail market. As far as turnkeys, yes, we're reflecting, you know, a, a, a price reduction. Um, but I mean, you're talking, you know, maybe $5,000 um, to reflect, you know, where the interest rate has moved. And remember, um, a couple of things. So you are getting a small discount to, to buy now. The second thing is um, cap rates are the same. You're still buying um, with that same return, um, even though cash on cash returns are slightly more compressed. Um, interest rates are temporary, Mike. I mean, I you know I was talking to one uh, home buyer, a really big home buyer in the city, excuse me, a home builder in the city yesterday. And um, he's a single family home guy. Um, and he was commenting how, interest the he said the only good thing mark is that interest rates are so high right now that it's easy for them to make the move 
come March, April, or May. He feels like they're trying to slam on the brakes so hard that we just lurch into that devastation, lack of demand, you know, that you were talking about in the destruction. But the, and, and then clearly with winter coming and the normal slow season anyway, it's really going to grind to a halt. He feels that there will be some kind of um, correction come, you know, April, May, June next year, where they'll be able to reduce it a full percentage point or 75 basis points to try and spur the market on. Again, just he was just commenting that it's just gone up so quickly that clearly they're, they're, he, he felt like before they only had one, they could only put their foot on the brake. They couldn't put their foot on the accelerator if they wanted to. There was, there was no impact. It was just running out of control like downhill. They had to pump the brakes hard enough to where they can actually have an impact if they want to tap their foot on the accelerator once in a while. So um, that was an interesting point um, that, that this big home builder was making. Um, I, I like the thought also, Mike, that you know, there is no time like now. House is a, a basket of commodities, um, as Bruce Norris likes to say. And as inflation rises and as rental rates rise, so do does everything, the value inside the home. So you know, the home price will go up because as inflation rises and gas rises and all our prices rise, the faucet that we put in for $150 can no longer be put in for $150. With labor and materials increasing, it is literally raising the value with this basket of commodities that you're sitting on. So that is all uh, one of our points. The last point I would make, Mike, and I would love your thoughts on this, is you have to do something with your cash. Like sitting idle cash is, you know, burying it under mattress, sticking it in a bank, which is equivalent to the same thing, you know, it is not a good investment strategy. Yes, you have to make wise investments, um, but you have to make investments. And so those that are looking for, you know, again, if that's uh, speculating, I would say just absolutely pause, don't go out and speculate. But if you have a strategy, you're working with an investment firm that can help you invest that capital on a wise basis, either through into some, you know, commercial investments or residential investments, turnkey, turnkey homes, would always encourage, uh, you know, investors to go in, and spend money building an asset column. Because as inflation goes, so goes assets, uh, the, the value of those assets on the back end. Yeah, thank you, Mark, for sharing that. Uh, I certainly agree with you that the house is a basket of commodities. So uh, the cost-driven inflation of these commodities has uh, inflated the value of the house, and it'll continue to be the case. So that makes total sense. As far as the uh, uh, the theory that the cash sitting in the bank is eroding in value, I agree with you. Generally, there's only two reasons to keep the cash in the bank. Uh, one is uh, as a dry powder. So if you're thinking it's going to be more great opportunities in the future and you want to have the, the, the dry powder. And then two is some kind of you know, safety. You have to have some percentage of your, in your portfolio in cash. Uh, beyond that, obviously idle cash is the yield on the portfolio and um, it's eroding uh, value with the, with the high inflation. So no argument there. Uh, but I will uh, provide an interesting comment. So. Uh, I agree with you that the interest rates are too high now for the U.S. economy to function well. So in general, the U.S. economy is heavily leveraged at every level. And uh, high interest rates, uh, at, at least at the level where, where they're now, make, make, make it very difficult for the U.S. economy to function. So you're right, the Fed pushed the, the accelerator pedal hard and fast. And that push... Uh, was so substantial that we're now beginning to feel the pain and the pain is beginning to be uh, very significant. Uh, I, I will uh, say this, I don't have a crystal ball or I used to have one, it broke, can find another one for sale. You've heard that story before. <laughs> uh, the Fed uh, loosening again in the spring would be absolutely great news. I mean, I, I would certainly welcome this. A lot of people would welcome this as the, the, the imposed pain is already substantial. Uh, nonetheless, uh, I think it'll be a little little bit later in the year. This is my position for the point that you have a natural spring when people will come to buy it anyway. It's just because it's a seasonal um, cycle for Midwest, Northeast, and, and other regions. But the interest rates, uh, for them to, to start reversing them, to start dropping the rates, it's back to the point I mentioned earlier. They need to see inflation figures substantially come down. Yep. And we're not seeing that yet. So I don't know what it'll take. Um, I, I certainly think, feel and, 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 and think that energy prices need to at least be sustainable, not escalate higher. If the energy goes up, that, that's a lot of pressure on inflation to continue to stay high. 
but what, what what's really important is uh, the uh, the fact that actions today take time to uh, kick through the system. So a lot of the they've made a lot of changes, a lot of rate hikes, and it takes six to twelve months for them to kick in. So it is possible by the spring we'll see uh, year over year inflation figures at that point substantially uh, better than they are now. <clears throat> And that's the hope, but I but yeah. uh, that's an optimistic hope. I was a little bit in that camp, but I have to say that now I feel that it's probably going to happen, but somewhat later next year. And I wish it was a little little bit earlier, but uh, we'll have to you know, w- w- uh, watch and and, and see. Uh, but at the end of the day, U.S. national debt, the debt of corporate debt, uh, the entire students' debt, the housing debt, everything else revolves around the interest rates, and the economy functions on interest rates. We just can't function on these rates. Um, what's really crazy is this. I remember when the rates were at this level, six, six and a half percent, seven years ago, but this was years ago. Now we've taken so much more debt from previous point that uh, you can't compare that. Yes, the rates used to be in the six, six and a half percent. That was sustainable then. Now we are in a very drastically different position. We move from the rates being about half this to where they are now within less than a year. And then that's the that that's the biggest problem, is that the speed of change, um, and the uh, volume of change, is of unprecedented proportion. Nobody knows really what what what's happening. As much as Fed is thinking they know what they're doing, I, I have to say that they're steering a gigantic ship, with the uh, with a, just two levers, right? The 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 primary lever being interest rate that they they set, and two the the quantitative easing or quantitative tightening. And, and the, 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 my concern is they will overdo, and I will all, all overdo massively. And before they know, they'll realize that the ship has passed way beyond the point that they wanted the ship to go to. Unfortunately, we will find out when it happens, and it's not going to be a pretty picture. Uh, so it's something like like this that uh, we just don't know. We just have to go with the Fed. Don't fight the Fed. Flow with the Fed. That You heard that expression. The problem is even the Fed doesn't really know what they're doing, in my view. At least they have a bunch of very smart people, uh, PhDs in, in, in economics and, and, and incredibly uh, smart uh, economists. At the same time, they've never done this before. They've never raised interest at this speed uh, and at this uh, velocity uh, and size in the past. So we, we are kind of entering a period of uh, unknown, uh, no presidents. Yeah, we'll see. I'm, I was uh, a little more bullish on this next six months being, you know, because I'm thinking in six months they may lower. But um, again, it remains to be seen. When you're saying six to 12 months for that to kick in, that makes sense. So we'll see. There, There is no crystal ball. I'm hopeful, um, I guess, more so than, than uh, um, well, I'm optimistic that, that they will get some. I, I just feel the pain, um, you know, at the pump. I feel the pain uh, uh, from consumers. I feel the pain from, you know, people that are buying on the retail side. So um, I, I see it and feel it. So I know that if we're feeling that in the Midwest, my goodness, the coast must be getting um, hammered as well. And I just believe that people are going to have to start cut, cutting back on luxury and, and uh, you know, any kind of consumer, um, you know, spending that that would not be um you know normally done so then you get airbnbs and hotels that are going to stop getting people traveling um i just what you you, the airlines just seem to come out with record profits but i don't know if that's going to be the truth for uh for q4 um we shall see but um yeah i i feel that the economy has slowed down very quickly and i'm hopeful that in the next six months um especially with this new rate hike um, that they're that they're calling for that we will be able to get back to some sense of normalcy for for next year. So again, it's all about setting expectations, Mike. And again, one of the other reasons, you know, that that we still can operate is because you know we are in the living room, we are buying houses on a daily basis. We're seeing the sellers and educating the sellers as to you know why their home is not worth what they think it's worth. Oh, my neighbor sold theirs for one hundred and fifty. Okay, that was in a different universe. That was seven months ago. Um, you know, it's, it changes um, on a daily basis now. And, and so we're walking away from deals we would have we would have bought seven months ago. And that's OK. I um, think, you know, knowing this was coming, um, positioning yourself to be in a position where you can take advantage of the market rather than be subject to it is important. And I feel that, you know, most of our friends uh, have kind of positioned themselves that way. 
Yeah, thank you, Mark. I, just a couple of um, for the comments on this. So uh, the bid and ask have, has, have widened. That that's what you just said. That the 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 asking price uh, for the sellers is based on their past view of the world, and it takes time for that pain point to sink in, and for them to actually compromise on what they feel that they should have gotten for this house or a commercial property or multifamily. Yeah. The same issue applies. So the, the bid and ask spread has to widen and the transaction volume has to drop until the time where either the pain is too great or the realization just comes in, I can't sell, I need to sell and, and that, that'll that just take a little bit of time. So I think we, we are in agreement that's gonna continue to trickle through in the upcoming months. And um, you as the buyer of these houses that does an innovation and then sells them, um, obviously staying very disciplined and you can't force somebody to sell, you just have to give them enough time where they, they'll realize. So that that's the environment that we're gonna find ourselves in for a while. The, the volume will just come down. Just just it's very difficult psychologically to agree your house is worth uh, less. The only reason you're gonna sell is you lost your job. If you lost your job, then the, the real pain is now kicking in. But you can't pay afford the mortgage if you don't sell. Whatever equity you have will dissipate over time. So um, it, it's a pain-driven sales decisions. Hopefully not necessarily. Um, uh, in the volume we've seen in 2008, where the foreclosure rates were just humongous, nonetheless, uh, that's what's going to motivate folks to be a little bit more uh, real re reasonable on a sales side and continue to give buyers uh, better opportunities. Uh, and then the other thing that I wanted to say on the um, rising interest rate, something interesting happens, the substitution effect. You, I'm sure you, 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 you're you already seeing this. So if people can't afford to buy, what do they have to do? They rent. So the demand for rent increases, generally uh, speaking. You still want to be in that same neighborhood. You still want to be in the same good area, but you just can't afford to pay a mortgage. So you wind up looking for a similar product with the with the rent. Yeah. And that, that's actually good for the owners of the properties. They can increase rents over time. Uh, uh, the, the only pain, the, the big pro problem with rapidly rising interest rates they usually are there because inflation is high, right? So the rents are rising and that's the good news for real estate investors. The bad news is that when the rates rise fast, faster, then you can increase rents uh, because these moves just happen. They, they happen quickly and you, you were looking for a mortgage yesterday and today and the rate is up now 50 basis points. So you feel the pain immediately as a buyer, a little bit less cash flow. But the good news is if inflation continues, you will see higher rents in the future. And that's sort of a, um, um, that's the counterbalancing factor. So it's something to keep in mind because a, a lot of buyers get uh, this massive concern. Well, my cash flow has just suffered. Well, that's, that's the truth, right? The price, uh, we're adjusting the price. The prices drop a little bit, but your cash flow has dropped more because the interest rates push the debt service faster. Just had it, got to be patient to let the inflation kick in over time. Those rents to rise over time, and that'll it'll take care. So investing, like you said, speculating for short term now is completely no good. But investing for a multi-year time horizon is still healthy as long as you have that multi-year time horizon. Yep, with good property management in place that can handle you know a good tenancy, you make sure that you increase rents and minimize you know vacancy and maintenance. Yeah, appreciate your wisdom. Um, all good things come must come to an end. That's that's, a, that's an expression from from Star Trek. I don't know if you. I'm a I'm a, I'm a tracker. So I, the last episode of the Next Generation, uh, the Q, the the the, the godlike being tells it to Jean Luc Picard. All good things must come to an end. He's about to destroy humanity. But the joke here is, is that, I mean, I mean this uh, that uh, only for the reason that. Good things must come to an end. So does this episode, not the destruction of humanity. <laughs> by a, well, I like to theme. think in, in this rising interest rate, interest rate economy, Mike, I prefer to think that what goes up must come down. Yeah. So the rates <laughs> go up and one day they'll come down. So you just got to be patient enough. Uh, and, and you're right that um, probably in the two, uh, let, let's just, let's be realistic here. Two to three year cycle, instead of saying, hey, they're going to start coming down next year, but two to three year cycle, We'll probably find the rates back down to where they were uh, probably a year ago. And that'll be great news for, for those folks who bought, held on to real estate, and they'll be in the position to refinance with lower interest rates. That's actually the power 
when the rates go up, refinance obviously becomes very difficult. But once they start coming down, refinancing becomes a huge viable option and that stimulates the economy in a massive way. It does because then you can also suck out some of the equity that's been built in the last two or three years as well. So you can harvest the equity, keep your, you know, have your payment go down, lower your interest rate and pull out some equity. Yeah, long-term investment and patient. Short, short-term vision now is going to be difficult. It's going to look a little, little gloomy, but um, uh, you have to be optimistic and you have to be diligent and you have to you have to do your work and and find good deals. And at the end of the day, real estate is still there. It's still better than, in my view, than stock market or many other alternatives. Yeah, I was just speaking with a, uh, a client yesterday that was. Um, interested in, in jumping on board and buying some turnkeys and you know asked her hey what what made you pick up the phone and and call us and she said well i've been listening to you for a while but um since march i've lost a third of my uh 401k that's a very real thing yeah unfortunately uh folks that this is the bad part this is where the, this is where the wall street have got everyone everyone accustomed to invest into what's easy and what's easy is their products the uh effectively the stocks and the mutual funds and most people don't take any action when the market um, starts correcting what they do it at the wrong point in the market. So unfortunately, uh, it becomes a, uh, it's a dropping knife right now. That's that's the bad part. So folks are saying, well, it's, it's dropped 30%, let's go buy. Uh, certainly a matter of opinion, but it could be a dropping knife. It may not be over. So we'll see what happens. We'll see. Thanks for your time, Mike. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate your wisdom. Oh, how would folks get a hold of you? Uh, that's really important. Uh, oh, <clears throat> thank you. Hey, uh, always best to um, follow on social. Um, you can go to uh, YouTube. We're putting a lot of content through the Mistake Free Real Estate brand. Um, you can follow me at Mark Delator on Instagram, um, also on Facebook. Um, and so, yeah, please just reach out on social. And um, I think that's normally the easiest way. I try and put out content. I have a social media manager that um loves to you know provide and educate you know all the things we're talking about today we're trying to give people insights on a daily basis as how this is impacting um you know the the world that we live in here as real estate turnkey providers so um that would be the best way and you can always just go to mistakefreerealestate.com that's an awesome uh website mistakefreerealestate.com that's great thank you for for education thank you for coming on the podcast well, Thank you, great Mike. To talk to you. Great to see you. You too. You're listening to Mistake Free Real Estate Radio, the authority in passive real estate investing. No late night calls, no clogged drains, no tenant nightmares. Take the passive investor's approach to real estate investing and trust a turnkey professional. Learn more at mistakefreerealestate.com. Until next time, remember, you don't get rich from what you earn, you get rich from what you own.